So I think some of the things we've learned about are very bone specific, but we discovered them because we were interested in the blood. And we think now actually that this idea that a bone cell could become perturbed and affect blood cells, in fact that model now is not just a peculiar model in the animal. We think it actually could have some contribution to human disease. That is, if these stem cells in a human got perturbed the way they do in other tissue systems, maybe, which happens just because of genetic injury by chance, maybe they're providing an abnormal environment that leads to the development of blood diseases that are really quite common in the elderly. We think if we can understand those diseases in terms of a relationship between different cell types, that means there's communication occurring across the divide of a cell, one cell to another. That's a very druggable space. Now I can be on the Google homepage and I can uh, mouse over a link and I get a preview of what's going on on that web page before I even have to click on it. So really what we wanted was that for motor neurons for studying ALS. We wanted kind of a page preview, a way to take a quick look at that motor neuron and see if there was anything uh, wrong with it. So we thought about it and really inspired by both Shinya Yamanaka's original IPS reprogramming experiments, but also um, you know, our next door neighbor, Doug Melton and Joe Zhao, um, their ability to transform one type of pancreatic cell into another. We thought maybe we could do this with motor neurons. And now the exciting thing that we're on to, the thing which is next, is um, to really carry out our little page previews. And, um, and in some cases, we're already seeing from those small number of neurons that certain ALS patients have signatures of disease which are different from others. So our motivation is to understand how, how stem cells express genes, specifically in those cells and not other cells. So let's say that we want to study the expression of a gene. Let's imagine that it's one of the pair of a necklace, okay? And so there are different areas of the chain in the necklace that could control how this gene is regulated. So just the areas, uh, they're very close to the pearl, left and right to the pearl. It's what traditionally has been studied so far to see how the gene expression was controlled. What we have discovered instead for the first time in stem cells in this publication that we had just recently obtained is that also areas of the necklace that are very far apart from the pearl, so let, let's say very left and very right, very distant, are very important to control uh, gene expression. So we have seen how basically the, this necklace uh, plays a three-dimensional role and folds on itself to go and control uh, gene uh, expression. The, the impact of this observation for, for human health or understanding human disease is the following. Um, there are many tissues where adult stem cells have not been identified and where markers are not available to, um, to isolate these cells and study these cells. So what I think one uh, implication of observation is that SOX2 appears to be a widespread marker of not only embryonic and fetal stem cells, but also adult stem cells. And we can now use this marker to isolate these cells. And when we did this, we could actually restore uh, um, spermatogenesis, so much for sperm formation, which was really exciting because it showed that not only in vivo in the context of this lineage tracing can we produce all these mature cell labs, but these cells can also be isolated from a mouse um, and then transplanted into another mouse that is infertile and can restore um, some of the genesis and produce mature sperm. Fragile X is actually one of the most common inherited forms of intellectual disability. It's a highly prevalent disorder then, affecting about one in 4,000 uh, male children. But our understanding of the pathogenesis and also our ability to treat the disorder is really, really, um, unfortunately, at a, a very primitive um, state. And so we were interested then in creating uh, neuronal models that we could study disease pathogenesis and begin to think about developing uh, new treatments for uh, the disorder. And could see that actually in our fragile X iPS cells that the fMR1 gene was actually um, silenced. And that silencing remained then when we induced those um, cells to further differentiate into postmitotic neurons. And it was doing that differentiation that we began to reveal real differences, though, between normal healthy control lines and fragile X patient lines. And what I think was most exciting is we were able to create these phenotypes, often in a miniaturized format that is subsequently now um, amenable to developing high-throughput screens. And that's one of the sort of next directions for us is to begin to um, take the phenotypes that we can observe now and try to think about how to develop a therapeutic that perhaps can reverse those phenotypes then uh, in the dish. We have a lot of the molecular recipe for how to build those, 
But what we don't know is if they can actually function and whether they could make a person better. And we decided to address this in mice. So what we did was we went back and studied when do those four kinds of neurons get born during development. We figured that out. Then we isolated those neurons among others and did tiny, tiny little transplantation of those young immature neurons, essentially at the time they're just coming out of progenitors or what some would term stem cells in the brain. And what we found, quite strikingly, is that these new kinds of cells turned into the four right kinds of neurons. Because we put them in a place where the signaling wasn't happening, they could find locations to live and therefore they survived. They listened to the leptin. They became electrically active in response to leptin, to glucose, and to insulin just the right way that the, this circuit should work. And most strikingly, instead of morbidly obese mice, the mice that we transplanted the correct cells in became overweight, but not morbidly obese. So they were about 60% less obese than the other mice. But what this tells us for the first time in the field is if we could get the right kind of neuron that degenerates in ALS, or the right kind of neuron that degenerates in Parkinson's or Huntington's. There's the possibility, if we do it just right, get them just perfect, that they'll wire up and function essentially like normal. A major problem in um, repairing damaged hearts is to generate new myocytes to replace lost myocytes. And the HIPPO and YAP pathway has been shown in many contexts to regulate cell proliferation. And so we hypothesize that by uh, activating YAP, we might be able to stimulate myocyte proliferation. So when we inactivated YAP in the fetal heart, uh, we saw a dramatic decrease in myocyte proliferation. And when we activated YAP uh, in the fetal cardiomyocytes, we saw a dramatic uh, overgrowth of cardiomyocytes. In the postnatal heart, we activated uh, YAP, and we were also able to prevent the postnatal myocytes from withdrawing from the cell cycle. In addition, the, we, we were able to uh, stimulate the myocytes to proliferate. These results uh, suggested that YAP uh, activation could stimulate myocyte proliferation. Uh, but the big challenge is to try to induce adult cardiomyocytes to re-enter the cell cycle. So what we wanted to do was to attempt to make human airway tissue in a dish. And one of the reasons for that is to study a whole set of diseases, some of them very common, like COPD or emphysema or lung cancer, and some of them much rarer, like interstitial lung disease or cystic fibrosis. So what we did, we were very fortunate to be at a hospital with a cystic fibrosis clinic, and we collaborated intimately with the clinicians who helped us identify patients. And with my colleagues, Kieran Musanuru and Chad Cowan, who are also in the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, and um, we were able to take skin biopsies from those patients, make stem cells from them, and then one of my, one of my postdoctoral fellows, Homei Mao, was able to go through a series of steps that converted that patient stem cell into actually lung tissue. And in the first instance, what we'd like to do is find a new drug to treat cystic fibrosis. But we've already extended our studies to think about very rare diseases. There's a disease called a ciliopathy. And that's another disease that you could model really easily in a dish because you can literally see that the airway epithelium doesn't have cilia that beat well. So, the, so we start with a rare disease where we really know what's going on, and we might really be able to do things that affect the vast majority of people. But then, once we have these two proofs of principle, I think sky's the limit. In principle, we can study any lung disease that affects the airway. And what we found was that it's, paradoxically, it is the more differentiated cells that are the metastatic cell type. 
whereas the more um, immature cells are the cells that have the cancer stem cell phenotype. We're not the first cells to seed new areas of tumor growth. It ends up that, at least in our tumors in zebrafish, that that cell population is not the only cell population that's important, and that the more differentiated cells, like I said, are the ones that go somewhere and cause the tumors to regrow. So really the idea is that you need to target both cell populations in order for the tumors to go away. One of the other things that we're still incredibly fascinated by is that although those cells are the migratory cell type, they can't make cancer. So how is it that one of these cells that is metastatic lands somewhere and then recruits slow-moving stem cells over time? The hedgehog pathway is involved in the development of much of the embryo. Um, and it turns out, however, to be involved not just in degenerative diseases, but also in cancer. We decided to do this in a way that people hadn't really uh, done it at scale before, which is instead of using a standard kind of reporter gene assay, we used a very biological assay. It was a biological assay that involved a high content um, based imaging screen. So in this assay, we tried to capture the very fundamental aspect of hedgehog signaling, which is the translocation of a protein called smoothened from the cytoplasm to the membrane. So we found some very interesting things, including the things that we set out to find, which is to say molecules that inhibit even the mutated forms of smoothened. We then went on and with the funding of the Harvard Accelerator Program, um, used our knowledge uh, gained from this small screen to conduct a much, much bigger screen of a real drug-like um, chemical diversity collection that contained 56,000 molecules. And from that screen, which worked very, very well, we got a massive amount of data, identified many new kinds of hedgehog antagonists and agonists, and we're excited about working out how these new kinds of molecules act and what their clinical potential may be.